Okay, our last example, finally. Chapter one and chapter two are really long because we're just establishing the world that statistics lives in, just laying that groundwork, getting all that vocab taken care of. So it takes a while to get through all of this. All right, example 19, a pair of studies was performed to measure the effectiveness of a, of a new software program designed to help stroke patients regain their problem solving skills. Patients were asked to use the software program twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. The studies observed 200 stroke patients recovering over a period of several weeks. The first study collected it the first study collected the data in table one, the second study collected the data in table two. All right, so we have 200 stroke patients, right? And we've got two, two run-throughs of, of this experiment. So we had the 200 stroke patients, they use this software program twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, excuse me, once in the evening. All right, and we had, we if we take a look at this first experiment. Let's look at the data that's that's resulting here. So for the 200 patients that use the program, 142 showed improvement, 143, excuse me, 43 didn't, and 15 actually deteriorated. And then we have this set of 200, right, that were in our control group, 72 showed improvement, 110 didn't show improvement, 18 deteriorated. And let's just do a quick check. If I add these numbers up, I've got 142. Oops, let me move that up, 142. I've got 43 and I've got 15. So it does look like 200 folks were in that experiment. And we do 72 plus 110 plus 18. And there are my other 200 folks. So I had 200 folks in each group, right? The group that used the program, the group that didn't. And, and just while looking at it, right, it, it does look, based on this one, that the folks who showed improvement, that there was a larger number of folks that showed improvement compared um, that used the program compared to that didn't. Because right? 142 is almost double 72. So just based on this first experiment, it does look like using the program helped overall in terms of these stroke patients regaining their problem solving skills. And I don't know what type of test they used to analyze these patients. Uh, maybe they gave them some word problems at the end and 142 that used the program showed improvement, but only 72 showed improvement on the, on the, for the folks that didn't use the, the computer program or the software program. So they had some kind of metric to gain, um, gain knowledge of, yes, they improved their problem solving skills, no, they didn't, or they even deteriorated. But again, just looking at, looking at this this table, this frequency table, it's looking pretty good, right? I mean, you see no improvement here, 110 compared to 43. Like that's much higher for the folks that didn't use the program. All right, let's look at the second experiment. So they ran this twice. And the second experiment, I've got my results over here in table two. So if I look at the second experiment, in terms of showed improvement, I still got more folks showing improvement who use the program when compared to those who didn't. But the discrepancy isn't as large, right? 142 to 72 is a much larger ratio than 105 to 89. And one thing I just wanna point out, let's add these numbers up just so you can see them. 105 plus 74 plus 19 is 198. And I don't know what happened to two of the folks in this experiment. Somehow they didn't make it out the other side. It happens. Welcome to stats, the real world is very messy. Things go wrong all the time, and we usually just roll with it, right? Try and make the best of it, kind of like life. So two folks who use the program didn't make it out the back end. We could call that if we wanted a non-response bias. I don't think two people is large enough to affect my overall interpretation of these numbers, but, but I just wanted to point it out. So if I'm looking at this, when we ran the experiment the first time, it was looking good, right? I was thinking if I, if I made that software program, I am loving experiment number one. If I made that software program, I'm liking experiment number two. Because in both of these, they showed improvement stronger for those who used the program than didn't, but experiment number one is looking great. All right, so now with all of that being said, I haven't even gotten to what was being asked of me. I just kind of wanted to break down this table so we could get some gut feelings for it. So let's take a look at what's being asked of us in this first, 
first part. So the first study was performed by the company that designed the software program. The second study was performed by the American Medical Association, the AMA. Which study is more reliable? All right, so let's break this down. This first experiment, this was done by the company that makes the software program. This was done, the second one was done by the Independent American Medical Association. So these guys had a vested interest in this experiment, the, soft, the, the, um, the, the software designers. They had a vested interest in the, in the outcome showing that their, their software program worked. These guys do not have a vested interest. I mean, we could make the argument that maybe somebody paid them off, but I don't want to do too many conspiracy theories just yet. Let's pretend these guys are on the up and up. They have no, no vested interest. They just want to see if it works or not. So it's interesting in that the first experiment showed a more positive result for that software program than the second experiment, and there is a bias in this, right? The folks running this experiment are biased. They are the designers of the software program, and they're understandably biased. I'm not even knocking them. I'm just saying, stating a fact, like they're biased. They want those results to look really positive for this software program they're creating. So in terms of answering the question, which study is more reliable, the second study is more reliable. The software company I'm gonna, is, is understandably biased as they have a vested interest in the results. And to counter that, I would hope that the AMA was not biased. Okay. So again, just taking note that I'm using complete sentences, I'm answering all of the questions asked of me. All right, let's look at part B. It says the company takes the two study as excuse me, the company takes the two studies as proof that their software causes mental improvements in stroke patients. Is this a fair statement? So they're saying, hey, we ran this twice. We got the results we wanted. And both of these, these folks are showing improvement if they, if they use this software program. So in terms of proof, all right, now we're going to get into a fun little, a fun little gray area of stats. All right. I would say that these two experiments look promising. They both look promising. The first one looks more promising. Obviously, experiment one looks more promising. But even when it was being run by the AMA, it still looks promising. Like, I, if, if this was representative of what would really happen out in the real world, I'd probably roll the die and say, hey, maybe it's time to use the program. It looks like it's helping folks show improvement in their problem-solving skills. So the studies look promising as both groups had more people improving than not improving or deteriorating. And that was especially true of the first group. So let me write that sentence down.
while some folks might say, oh, you can't see that, excuse me. All right, and some folks might say, well, two is enough. And again, that's the gray area. How many experiments do you need to run? Well, I don't know if two is enough, especially if the first study was done by the, the, the designers of the program, but you'll hear this term out in the real world, replication and peer review. So the idea behind that is the more and more often you can replicate these same results, the more reliable those results become. So I've replicated this twice. If I could replicate these results a third, fourth, fifth time, it'll really show us some evidence that this software program is working. All right, so the more often you can replicate, the better. The fun kicks in where you need time and you need money to keep replicating your experiments, okay? And then you'll hear another term out in the real world called peer review. Once you replicate these experiments, you need to write it up and send it out to your colleagues so they can peer review it and look for mistakes and try and find cracks in your findings or say, hey, this does look good, congrats on doing this. So further experiments for replication are needed as well as peer review. Now I say may be needed because I, I don't have a hold on all of the regulations that are out there for if you're putting a software program out, how many experiment replications do you need? How many peer reviews do you need? I think that changes just depending on what you're trying to um, put forward to the public. So it's possible further experiments for replication might be needed as well as peer review, just depends. All right, let's look at the last question here. Patients who use the software were also part of an, ex an exercise program, or patients who did not use the software were not. Does this change the validity of the conclusions from Part B? So if we remember our conclusions from Part B, we're saying this study looks promising. It looks like this software program might really cause your problem-solving skills to improve after a stroke, which would be great. But then we find out the patients who were on the exercise program, excuse me, that were on the software program also were exercising. So this creates a problem in that if I go back to all of these numbers, all right, let me scooch this down. Did these 142 folks show an improvement because of the program or because they exercised? Did these 105 folks show an improvement because of the program or because they exercised? So since you had, between your two treatment groups, since you had one exercising and one not exercising, you introduce this confounding variable. Now you're not sure, hey, was it the exercise or the software program? So I'll, I'll write that up in a moment. A better experimental design would have said, well, make both of them exercise or both of them not exercise or inside the folks that use the program have little subgroups of exercise, not exercise, and then inside the do not use the computer program have little subgroups of exercise, not exercise. That would have been a better experimental design. That wasn't the setup of this problem. So I'm gonna write that, that solution up. I'm gonna answer the question asked of me. So does this change the validity of the conclusions from part B? Yes, it does. So there is my direct answer. Yes, the exercise program is a confounding variable. Okay, so was the improvement in problem solving skills due to the software or the exercise? We just, we don't know, it's confounded.
that is a wrap for chapter one. So now it's time to go get started on your homework and I will see you on the flip when we get to chapter two. Thanks gang.